Well, good evening, church family. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're so glad that you're with us tonight as we continue our study in the book of Philippians and talking about Paul. We've been talking about Paul's testimony for the last couple of weeks, talking about Paul before he got saved and after he got saved. What a testimony that Paul had, and it should be our all of our testimonies, as we've already talked, all of our testimonies should be that uh, we're not the same person that we once were, that we've changed. We've not only changed, but we've tra changed drastically from being lost to being a child of God. Tonight we're going to continue to look at uh, Paul's uh, life, and we look at uh, as we look at Philippians, the third chapter, verses 12 through 16, we're going to call this message tonight, Reaching for the Prize, Part 1. We'll do Part 2 next week, but today, Reaching for the Prize, Part 1, The Prerequisites of Pursuing Spiritual Perfection. Now, I want you to understand what I just said, the prerequisites of pursuing. I did not say obtaining perfection. I said pursuing spiritual perfection. Perfection. Okay, so let's look at Philippians, the third chapter. We're going to look at the scripture as we get started tonight. Verses 12 through 16. I think this is one of my favorite uh, passages of scripture. And we see as we look at Paul's uh, writings, we can, we can judge that Paul must have been a sports fan. And I think I was probably speaking to a lot of sports fans uh, here tonight. But Paul must have been a, a sports fan because he used uh, athletic metaphors over and over again, and we'll see it even tonight in his, in his writing. So um, it'll be kind of fun and interesting for us to look at uh, Philippians 3, beginning in verse 12. He says, Not that I have already grasped it or it all or have already become perfect. Now, remember, he's saying, He's not saying he's perfect. He said, I have not become perfect, but I press on if I may also take hold of that for which I was even taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Now he talks to you and me. He, he says, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm reaching out for it. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. And we're going to talk about that a lot more in a few minutes. But I want you to really think about what Paul is saying. He said, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to that which lies ahead. He says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, all who are mature, let's have this attitude. Let's, let's think alike. Let's have this attitude. Those that are mature in Christ. God will reveal to you as well. However, let's keep living by that same standard to which we have obtained. All right. Let's look at that scripture tonight. Let's break that down just a minute. As we think about, as we think about again, Paul using athletic metaphors uh, to uh, describe to us uh, the point he's trying to get across about living a life, pressing forward, reaching the goal, winning the prize, those things he's talking about tonight. So speaking of his desire to be effective in his Christian life, here's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, 26. He says, therefore, remember these athletic metaphors, therefore, I run in such a way as not to aim, run aimlessly. I box in such a way as to avoid hitting there. And I, I love that. I mean, if you think about these athletic metaphors that he's using here, he's, he says, I, I run in a way that's not just aimless running. I, I, I used to run until my, my knees kind of wore out on me, and now I walk. But uh, I have a tendency to to find myself just kind of, I have a, a, a certain distance I go and I, somewhere along the way I find myself just st staggering through that walk and just kind of aimlessly wandering through that. Paul says that's not the way he, he goes. He says, he says, therefore I run in such a way as not to run aimlessly. And he says, I box. 
You know, he's talking about boxing. He says, in such a way as to avoid hitting it. He says, I'm not wasting motion. When I, when I throw my fist out there, I hit something. He says, I don't waste any time, any effort, any motion. He says, I'm hitting the target that I'm aiming for. He describes a Christian life to the Ephesians in Ephesians 6.12. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. He describes the Christian life. He describes it as, as a battle. It's a fight. And that's the way a Christian life is. It's a, it's a battle. We're, we're always fighting the enemy in what we would probably consider Paul's epitaph in 2 Timothy 4, 7. He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. I, have a, I, I hope all of us can say that as we approach the end of our, our life and the end, end of our walk in this life, this physical life, that I've fought the good fight. I mean, I've done the best I can to serve the Lord. I've done the best I can to, to, to be Christ-like. I've done the best I can to be a, a good witness and to share the gospel. He says, that's the good fight. That's the good fight. Being a Christian is a good fight. He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I stayed the course. Remember with these athletic metaphors, it's like a race. I started I did the best I could. As some of you run, some of you may walk, and you start out and you do the best you can to get to the finish. I always, when, when I walk, I always, I, I kind of have a, a point where I stop and turn around. I, I leave my house and I, and I head away from home, and I, I usually walk in the neighborhood where I live, and I have a point where I, the halfway mark where I stop and I turn around and I head back home. And so that, that mark for me when I'm walking is I walk to that halfway point and I know that I'm halfway there. And I turn around and then my, my goal is to get home. And hopefully I do. But, but Paul says, for my struggles, he he. He says, he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. So as we looked at Paul's testimony over the last couple of weeks, we're going to look at uh, and, and how he was, his conversion on the Damascus Road changed him dramatically from the person he was to the person he became. And, and in our text tonight, we see that Paul gives us, I believe, six necessary prerequisites for a being effective in striving for the prize in our Christian walk, in our Christ likeness. Remember, being a Christian means to be like Christ. So the first thing I want us to look at tonight <clears throat> is pursuing the prize requires a proper awareness. Look at, let's go back to the scripture we read earlier. It said, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. You see, all believers are now in Christ and we enjoy a certain level of, of uh, uh, happiness here in our Christian walk, but our eternal walk, our internal life is where we fix and where we focus. And that's what, that's what uh, Paul is talking about here. First Peter 1 Peter 1.4 says to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You see, as a Christian, I, I do want to live a Christ-like life. I do want to share the gospel. I do want to bring, bring people to the foot of the cross while God allows me to stay in this fleshly body here on this earth. But this is not my home as a child of God. My home is in heaven, my eternal home. And so we're, we're looking for that inheritance, that eternal home. So despite the rich blessings that we have in Christ today, our goal is to be in heaven 
with Christ. So obviously pursuing the prize of spiritual perfection begins uh, with a dissatisfaction with our own present spiritual condition. So if I'm going to be looking, if my, if my goal is eternal, then my life should be looking towards those things that are eternal, and I should never be satisfied with my spiritual self. I should always be striving for spiritual perfection. And I will never strive for spiritual perfection until I'm dissatisfied with my spiritual condition. Did you get it? I've got to be dissatisfied with myself to be encouraged to press towards the mark of the high calling, to press forward to move forward, to look towards heaven. So I can't be satisfied within myself because people who think they've reached that spiritual perfection uh, will never uh, be encouraged to pursue a better condition or, or a more spiritual perfection in their life. If I become satisfied within myself, then there's no reason, if I think I've already obtained perfection, there's no reason for me to strive for that. So what happens is if I, if I think because I'm in Christ that I'm be spiritually perfect already, then I become complacent and content and uh, I become really in a place of grave danger of becoming insensitive to the sins and, and the things around me. Uh, I become kind of spiritually blind and blind to the weaknesses that are in my life. And so we have to watch becoming complacent within our own self, always realizing we're, we're spiritually imperfect and we're striving to be perfect. It's only those who are aware of their desperate spiritual need who come to Christ for salvation. In other words, well, it's the same scenario you know, when you came to Christ, you had to establish the fact in your own heart you had no place else to go. You were, you were, you were empty. You had no value. Uh, there was nothing in you. You had to be devoid of all self. You had to get to a place where you knew that you needed someone in your life. You needed Jesus Christ to fill that giant void that was in your life. Matthew 5, 6 kind of puts it this way. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger. You know, you know how you feel when you're hungry? I'm not talking about just that you need a snack. I'm talking about really hungry, that you haven't eaten, and you realize all of a sudden that, man, you've missed a meal or missed two meals, and, and you're really hungry. And you can't get food off of your mind. When you're hungry, all you think about is eating. And what Paul's saying, that's the way that our spiritual desires ought to be. We ought to be hungry. He says, hunger and thirst for righteousness, which righteousness only comes from God. And it's only those who continue to recognize the need to eliminate sin and cultivate holiness who will make progress in that Christian life and Christian walk. All right, secondly, pursuing the prize requires a maximum effort. You never accomplish anything if you don't have effort behind it. He says, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. True believers will not pursue the prize of spiritual perfection until they recognize the need to improve their condition. But awareness of the need is not enough. There's got to be diligent pursuit. I've got to pursue. I, I go back uh, only because it's kind of fresh on my mind to walking. Uh, I Again, I used to run, and then I walked for years and years and years. And, and over the, the, the COVID crisis that we've had, and like many people, I've kind of kind of got out of the habit of walking and doing things that I normally do. And about a month ago, I started walking again. And I realized that I'm one of those people, 
if I don't push myself, if I don't make myself, I get home many times and I walk in the evening, which is not the best time to walk because you, you've been uh, uh, doing things all day, you've been working all day, you've been taking care of things all day, and you're tired. But that's the only time it works good for me. So when I get home, I have to force myself to, to change clothes and put on my little walking shoes and to get out there and walk. And sometimes I don't want to. But if I don't push myself, if I don't make myself, then if I miss today, it's real easy to miss tomorrow. If I miss tomorrow, I miss the next day, and all of a sudden I'm not walking at all, and I need to walk. So pursuing the prize, recognize an effort. We've got to have a, an effort there. And true believers have to be diligent in their pursuit. The Christian life is a lifelong pursuit of Christ's life. It's just like living a healthy life. Living a healthy life is a lifelong pursuit. Uh, and so living a Christian life is a lifelong pursuit. It's a progression and we never stop moving forward. We don't look backwards. We move forward. I can't do anything. Remember, I can't do anything about the past. I, I, I can only take care of the present and the future. But I have to pursue Christ's likeness in that. Thirdly, pursuing the prize requires a focused concentration. Look at what he says. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. A maximum effort without focused concentration is useless. Every athlete knows that runners in a race must fix their eyes ahead of them. Those who watch the crowd or watch their feet or watch the ground, guess what? You'll trip and fall. I get scolded all the time because I have a tendency to, when I walk, to hang my head down and look at my feet. It's not because I, I didn't set my eyes on the prize. It's because if I don't like watch my feet, I'll trip over the sidewalk and fall down. No, but I, I'm saying this, that you've got to focus. You've got to have a good athlete, and I'm not a good athlete, but a good athlete, a, a high performing athlete, especially a runner, has to fix their eyes. They have to focus, become laser focused on the end, not the beginning, but on the end. It's not how I, it's not how I drive, it's how I arrive. It's not as much as how I start, it's how I finish. And I can't finish well unless I'm laser focused. Though Paul had uh, not achieve spiritual perfection, he had that blessed discontent that motivated him to pursue it. He was always discontent with his spiritual situation. He says, I, I'm content in every situation I'm in, but he was always, he was always seeking to do better, always, always wanting more, always looking to that prize. You know, Paul was one, if you're not laser focused like Paul became, you know, people, we dabble in a lot of different things. Uh, you know, uh, we're, uh, you know, we, we say many times we get, we're, we're so involved in so many things that we're, we're, we have, we have some ability in everything, but we don't have a, a mastery of anything. And to be successful, we've got to narrow our focus People, if we're going to succeed in life and we have to focus on what those life pursuits are. So we dabble in a lot of things, but we've got to learn to focus because if we don't, then despite all the energy that we expend, we accomplish very little. You ever feel like you're just kind of like that proverbial mouse in the cage, just running and running and running and running and running and you don't accomplish anything, that's the way life is sometimes. If we don't stay focused on the prize and we know what the prize is, the prize is Christ Jesus, then sometimes that we, 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 our life just becomes full of sound and fury, so to speak, just signifying nothing. We, just a lot of commotion. Our life is a lot of commotion, but 
we're not really doing anything. We're not really affecting anything. We're running, running, running. It's kind of like that old adage, man, I'm wore out. I've been going, going, going all day, and it doesn't seem like I've accomplished anything. And that's what life can do to you sometimes. We can just seem like we're just burning it at both ends, burning the candle at both ends, but I don't seem to be accomplishing anything. James kind of put it to us like this. He said in James 1.8, he said, being double-minded man and unstable in all ways. I can't, I can't live two lives. I can't live three lives. I can't be double-minded. I can't, I can't think one way today and another way tomorrow. Uh, that's what Paul's talking about. Paul, Paul made a break with everything he, in, in his past. And when he did that, he did away with all of it, both good and bad. Religious achievement, virtuous deeds, great success in ministry, as well as sins, missed opportunities, and disasters must all be forgotten. All the good things, all the bad things in the past must be forgotten. I want you to write this down, okay? I want you to write this statement down. So listen to me because it's not going to be on the screen. Believers cannot live on past victories, nor should they be debilitated by the guilt of past sins. Did you get it? Believers cannot live on past victories, and they can't be debilitated by their past sins. The past is the past. You know, it's kind of like, what'd you do for me today? And that's that's really the question. Jesus is asking us. You may have had the greatest victories in the past or you may have had the worst sin in your life in the past, but we can't rest on those victories or be debilitated by those sins. That we... Today's a new day. Today's a brand new day. Tomorrow is our future. Let's forget about the past. Let's, let's, what can I do today? Lord, I I got up this morning. You allowed me to open my eyes. Now, what can I do for you today? Number four, pursuing the prize requires a proper motivation. Look what he says. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The prize was what motivated him not only to run, but to win. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race, they all run. Everybody, if you're in a race, you ever, I, I ran the St. Jude Marathon one time and uh, I was, uh, <laughs> I shared this, uh, I finished, you know, they, 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 you're in classes you're different classes by class by age group and experience and different things. And so I, I finished first in my class, the class I was running in, which was quite an achievement. But there were only three people in my class group. And the other two were on a cane and it, and in a wheelchair, so I'm, I finished first. But I, I did seriously. You, you, you have to, you have to win. I mean, you, you play to win. You, you go to win. Do you not know those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you're going to win. Don't ever, don't ever run to lose. Don't ever, don't ever say, well. I'm going to run. I'm going to do the best I can, but I know I'm going to lose anyway. No. And in the Christian life, in the spiritual life, it's the same way. Don't, don't be defeated before you ever get started. Always remember that who you represent and who lives within you, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ, Christ who strengthens me. Man, when I start, I can finish. When I start to race, I can win. When I start to be a witness, God's going to finish it for me. I don't have to finish it. 
God's going to finish it. If I'm sharing the gospel, it's not my responsibility. As long as I'm doing what God tells me to do, the victory is His. It's not mine. It's His and His alone. So Paul, Paul is saying believers will not receive the prize until the call of God in Christ. What he's saying is that it's an effort, but the prize is at the end. But I've got to run like I'm going to win the race. And guess what? For a child of God, I've said this before, for a child of God, I've read the book. All that life throws at me, all that the situations that we find ourselves in, and every one of us find ourselves in difficult situations from time to time. But I've read the book. I've read the ending. And I know one thing. I win. No matter what life throws at me in the end, I win. I am the triumphant runner. I'm pumping my fist. I, I was, uh, I, I haven't shared this. I, it was shared in, in church uh, uh, a week or so ago. But I, I love to play golf. I'm not really a golfer. I'm a, I'm a duffer, but I love to play. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I did what every golfer dreams of. I, I made a hole-in-one. Now, I, I'm pretty sure, and I may have some that disagree with me, and you do have to, you do have to, to get close to have a chance to make a hole-in-one, but to hit a little white ball into a little hole in the ground, 120 yards, and it goes in the hole, that's kind of luck. I mean, it's just, people can say it's skill, and you do have to kind of get it up there, but it, it's, it's a lot of luck involved in that. So I, I take no credit. It, it was, but I can remember standing on the green when I made that hole in one like, like some big athlete and pumping my fist. Yay, I did it. I did it. Well, that's what Paul is talking about, pumping that fist in there, approaching that finish line, being a winner. And I want to tell you something. We're winners. I mean, the world's going to, going to throw everything at you and tell you you're a loser. But as a child of God, we are a fist-pumping winner. Did you get it? We win. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Paul, Paul puts it this way. Man, I could have some struggles in life, but as long as I'm a fist-pumping winner, a Christian, a child of the king. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. In other words, all who have a relationship with Christ. That fist pumping is not just for Paul. It's for all of us. All right, number five. Pursuing the prize requires a proper recognition. Look at what he says. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. Here's, let's talk about that attitude. Paul, Paul was not in his spiritual race alone. His spiritual race includes Every believer, Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. For one offering, that offering was Christ Jesus. That offering was the cross. That offering was when he took all of our sins and put them on his shoulders. Not just for one, not just for a few, but for all who will believe. Paul was an experienced pastor and knew that all believers would share the strength and the relentlessness of his focus on pursuing the prize. All believers were going to be just like him, pursuing the prize, pursuing the prize. We also have the resources to understand that we're not doing this in within ourselves, but we're doing it in the power of God Almighty. 2 Peter 1 3. 
For His divine power has granted us to everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His glory and His excellence. Remember, when we're running the race, when we're fighting the fight, we're not doing it on our own strength. And Paul realizes we're not doing it on our own power. Look what it says, for His divine power. That's how we accomplish the goal of pursuing that spiritual perfection. Okay, let's look at lastly. Number six, pursuing the prize requires a proper conformity. Look what it says. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have obtained. I want us to look at four divinely provided resources that help believers to be consistent in pursuing the prize of Christ likeness. Four resources that we have at our disposal to help us to walk the walk and talk the talk and live a Christ-like life. The first one, we have the Word of God. 1 Peter 2.2 2. And like newborn babies long for pure milk of the Word so that, if, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. We've heard it many times about as a child of God, when we, we first get saved, we're on the milk, like a, like a baby is on the milk, the mother's milk. We're on the milk of the Word. But as we grow and as we develop, we get off of that milk and we start into the meat of the Word. As we study, we get into the meat of the Word. And so we see that the Word of God, how important that is for us to read, to study, to grow, to develop because of the Word. The Word of God is our, is our map, it's our direction, it's our, it's our recipe book for life. And the, the deeper we grow, the deeper we go into the Word, the deeper we study the Word, the more we allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to our spirit the Word, the stronger we become, the better athlete spiritual athlete we become. So the Word of God. Secondly, is prayer. 2 Corinthians 13, 9 says, For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray for, that you become mature. When I am weak, God is strong. Prayer strengthens my life because I draw strength from God through prayer. Number three, following a godly example. 1 Corinthians 4.16 Therefore I urge you, be imitators of me. Paul was saying be an imitator of me because I do the best I can to be an imitator of Christ. Be imitators of Christ. That's what he's really saying. Be an imitator of Christ. Follow a godly example. And we should be a godly example. People ought to look at our life and see how we live and say, that, that man or that woman, that boy or that girl, that young person, they're living their life for Christ. I can draw example from how they live. What we don't want to be is a bad example. What we don't want to be is people look at us and say, if that's what, what Christianity looks like, I don't want any part of it. We won't people to look at us and say, there's something different about that person. I'm looking at that person's face and they're glowing. They're smiling. They're happy. In adversity, they still have joy. <clears throat> that person, something's different. And the difference in your life and my life as a child of God is Christ in our life. So we have the Word of God. We have prayer. We have following a good example. And fourthly, God uses Trials to mold believers into an image of Christ. 1 Peter 5.10 After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to His eternal life and glory in Christ will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. God's going to do it. 
God himself is going to perfect you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. I read this little story. At the foot of one of the Swiss Alps is a marker honoring, you know, there's always somebody climbing the Swiss Alps. A man who fell climbing the Swiss Alps, fell to his death. And the marker reads, <clears throat> he, gave, he gives his name, and then it says, he died climbing. <laughs> he died climbing. I think that would be a good marker for all of us as Christians. We died climbing. Paul said, I fought the good fight. We can put it another way. I died climbing. Well, I hope tonight that you glean something from the Word of God, that you understand it's a race, and the race is to the finish line, and the finish line is Christ Jesus. And I want to be able to say, just like Paul, that I fought the good fight, I finished the race. God bless you for being with us tonight. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week, and may God put someone in your path this week that you can share Jesus with. See you next week.